Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited. Hi, everyone. My name is Jack Rico, and welcome to episode 147 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. This week, my guests are Cuban poet Richard Blanco and Puerto Rican band Busca Buya. We head home through the gloss of rain or weight of snow or the plum blush of dusk, but always, always home, always under one sky, our sky, and always one moon, like a silent drum tapping on every rooftop and every window of one country, all of us facing the stars Hope, a new constellation, waiting for us to map it, waiting for us to name it together. That was poet Richard Blanco at President Obama's second inauguration in 2013. He is the first Latino, immigrant, and openly gay poet to be chosen to read at a presidential inauguration. And with the much-talked-about recital of 22-year-old poet Amanda Gorman at the Biden-Harris inauguration, I decided to connect briefly with our Latino poet from his home in Maine, and I asked him what the role of poetry should be in our country right now. I think poetry right now, its place is to open that kind of conversation of, you know, who are we? Mm -hmm. What is a democracy? How are we talking to each other? Why aren't we talking to each other? Like I always like to say, America, the United States, this democracy is still a great, one of the greatest social experiments in history. And it's still a work in progress, though. It's still very much a work in progress. And we take five steps forward and three steps back, two steps forward, 20,000 steps back. <laughs> His 2019 book, How to Love a Country, explores through poems themes of immigration, gun violence, racism, LGBTQ issues, and what home means. For me, my passion has always been, um, or the thing I've been writing all my life, and as I like to say, you know, a poet is writing really one poem all their life, right? It's, it's a theme that, just keeps on adding new dimensions and asking new questions of you. It's, and for me, it's home and it's the idea of home. Uh, what does that mean? And now I'm starting to ask that question home in the context of country. With a flurry of entertaining musical performances returning for the inauguration this past week, I wanted to get Richard's take if he views rap as musical poetry. I think it's the same impulse. It's not necessarily the same art because they have the music. Music does a lot to create the emotion, even if it's just a beat, right? It's the same impulse. In fact, rap rap is kind of like that, that tradition of the village voice, of the poet being the village voice, right? Of... Um, it started as a way of sharing issues or speaking up or having a voice in marginalized communities of stories, people that, that were completely ignored by, by society, right? That urge to, to communicate, to speak to a community. And so I see that, I see a poem does the same thing. And we don't have music. We have to make that music with our gestures, with our, with our the only instrument we have is our voice. With what seems a renewed sense of interest in poetry in America, I asked Richard if he had any advice for Amanda Gorman and her journey as one of America's next great poets. For Amanda, I would say please continue to engage our youth. Please continue to be a, a beacon of light, uh, an example, a role model. They need you. Uh, we all need you, but they need you especially. That was poet Richard Blanco, who has a new book out called The Prince of Los Cocuyos, A Miami Childhood. Available now. And before we talk next with Buscabuya, it's time I give you my weekly review of what's happening in Latinx pop culture in a segment I like to call Jacked In. <laughs> 
Let's begin with the top movie, TV, and music news of the week. Billie Eilish sings in Spanish with Rosalia in Lo Vas a Olvidar. The New York Times music section features Ropa Cara from Camilo this week. The NBC Sports Network is folding at the end of this year. Elizabeth Vargas will be the new host of America's Most Wanted on Fox. And Gregory Sierra, actor on Barney Miller and Sanford and Son, has died at 83. And in tech and social media news, Google is redesigning their mobile Google search window soon. Instacart eliminates 2,000 jobs. The CW app became the number one app on the App Store this week. Apple is planning on eliminating the lightning port and slimming down the MacBook Air. And TikTok launches a Q&A feature that lets creators respond to fan questions using text or videos. <laughs> My favorite album of 2020 was a Latin experimental pop album called Regresa from Puerto Rican duo Busca Buya. Formed by Raquel Berrios and Luis Alfredo del Valle, Regresa includes 11 tracks which seem like a stream of hits from top to bottom. Every song is a song you can dance to, vibe to, reflect with. In my first interview with them, I asked how they've handled not having a live audience to perform to, why they won't sing in English, how their track La Fiebre is really about Bad Bunny, and how reggaeton is now being influenced by indie music. Buscabuya, welcome to the Highly Relevant Podcast. Thank you so much for having us. Very cool. How did you guys handle 2020? You know, and I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, the music business lost like about $2 billion. Music publishers lost close to $3 billion. And most musicians make monies uh, doing uh, royalties, live concerts. But the lack of touring, the lack of getting your music out there, the lack of having the audience that usually comes out in fervent uh, ways to, you know, feverish, passionate ways to consume music, uh, that kind of came to a halt. So how did Busca Buya deal with the 2020 pandemic? And how do you feel, even if it's optimistic or not, for 2021, for you making money? It's a tough one. Uh, well, yeah. No, I mean, you know, like like anybody who, who sort of <laughs> makes, uh, you know, a living off of music, you know, and playing music, as soon as you heard that there were going to be no concerts, you know, you had to start rethinking your entire life, you know, for the next couple months. Mm -hmm. But um, luckily, we we sort of, I don't know, we just, uh, a lot of things just started to click and we were like, okay, well, we can't get anybody else to do our, 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 our video, so we have to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have to do it with the iPhone. And so, and okay, so we can't get anybody to edit it, so we really have to learn how to edit the whole thing. So we just had to do do a lot of the stuff and and then and then slowly you know one or two things started coming in filtering in which were you know shows and, and live stream stuff and mm -hmm. um but it was it was all because we had sort of you know from the onset of the pandemic just started to do a lot of uh a lot of the work ourselves you know and uh and we've been doing a lot of remixes uh at late we did a lot of remixes later in the year right um which which would help you know what i mean keep the entire thing sort of yeah. afloat. But yeah, it was, it was, it was um, I, I look back on it and I actually kind of really like the, uh, the rush of like having to figure things out in such a weird time. Like, I don't know if it comes, um, I have a design background and usually in design, it's so much about problem solving and like working with like limited budgets <laughs> and like stuff like that. And it sounds like about, indie cinema. <laughs> yeah, kind of in a way. I mean, to, to tell you the truth, I mean, when we heard that we weren't going to be able to tour and that literally we had put maybe like the past two or three years of our lives for this album and that we never knew that we were going to put <sighs> yeah. it out during a pandemic mm -hmm. at the beginning. It was like, you've got to be kidding me. You know, at the beginning I was like, this is not happening. And then I don't know, I guess I got pretty spiritual. I'm like, Hey, like we would have had to, we would have probably been on the road for the entire summer. Like we mm -hmm. have a, a, you know, now a six year old. And then I kind of thought like, wait, like we, we get to hang with her. We get to spend time with her. And whatever and like you i'm sure everybody saved money you know by just staying home and cooking so in a way it kind of like um i don't know it felt like everything kind of was in place even though mm -hmm. at the same time it was kind of chaotic i guess that's maybe i don't know if a lot of people felt that way but it um it felt right and Lisa and i are very diy and very hands-on and i think that yeah. in a way, like we're kind of used to and, and 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 i think it's sort of the size that we're at you know we're a small independent band and 
you know, we don't have a huge. But you read much there. bigger, Raquel. You read much bigger. Can you kind of talk about the duality of Buscabuya? You guys obviously speak English perfectly. You're influenced by a lot of American artists. Is there a problem of a band like Buscabuya singing in English? I asked this to Juanes one day uh, and he felt like he was selling out. The weird thing is that I feel like what what we're able to do in Spanish, it's very hard to pull off in English. Why is that? I, I feel that as soon as I, I personally feel that as soon as I sing in English, I literally disappear. Wow. I feel like I've, you know, like, sure, like I, our sonics and our production definitely has a personality, but I think that so much of the wording, the way that you pronounce things, el sabor, like the, the mm, flavor. So you behind. lose the flavor, el sabor. I feel like I, I feel, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm not open to it. It would really depend on like sort of doing a project that would maybe um, conceptually convey not having those elements that we've sort of developed so far, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not like I'm saying that I would never do it. But so far, I personally haven't wanted to, haven't wanted to sing in, Spanish, in English because it almost feels like I just feel kind of weird. But, you know, Elado Negro and our friend de la Minas, like they go back and forth between Spanish and English all the time. And I feel like there's something cool, like uh, Caliucci's latest record. Yeah. She, she goes literally like one verse is English, one verse is Spanish. Spanish. And I think she really pulled it off really nicely. You know, I feel like sometimes... Um, yeah, sometimes people don't really get completely like how to sing well in both languages. And sometimes things can come off a little bit uh, uh, pretentious. You know what I mean? Mm. But, uh, but so far, personally, that's the way that I felt. But I know I don't know how you feel about it, but at least that's how I felt. About I really, it. You feel I really you're selling out, Luis? You feel like I, you're selling I, I out? Don't, you know, I'm not the singer, so I don't think I really <laughs> have too much of a problem. No, but uh, you're part of the vision of the sound and how you present right. yourself to the world. No, no, I, agree. I I think there is something kind of like Raquel says, there's something kind of unique about it actually being in Spanish. I mean, at least for now, it really, mm. there is something about it that is, uh, I mean, even, you know, we've heard like French friends of us, of ours say, uh, you know, it's, it's, I like that it's in Spanish because it's like familiar enough that I, I can get it, but it's different enough. That, that it's like, it seems like an unexplored world, you know? Right, right. That somebody from not an Anglo-speaking country, you know what I mean? Somebody whose who's dominant language is French, you know? So yeah. uh, maybe there's something to it. I don't know. We'll see. Um, you guys describe the Regres album, your feature debut album, as Latin experiment pop, or I guess that's how you would describe your whole sound. As Puerto Ricans who lived in New York and understand Puerto Rican culture, why didn't you musically just go right into reggaeton? Why did it go into Latin experimental pop? And then why do you think Latin experimental pop is still niche today? Well, it's niche in the States. Because if you go to Mexico City, you can turn on a couple of radio stations that will be playing Latin experimental pop all day. You know, uh, if you go, you yeah, know, Mexico City is really open to new genres and in Spanish. It's so, such you a know, huge market. It, it's that. niche in the States, but maybe that'll change. You know, we're, we're it, you know, I think, uh, you know, Latin America is, is sort of expanding in a way, you know, and, and we're the Latin American consciousness is going to be everywhere in, in this whole side of the, the, the continent. Mm. So, uh, you know, maybe it won't be niche for a long time. You know, it's OK that it's niche for now. It's kind of cool. I mean, I feel it's like kind of funny because of like the Urbano like genres, I keep seeing it get very inspired by what most of the sort of more indie Latin artists are doing anyway. Like I already see it kind of changing. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like in a way it's like, um, yeah, I guess I, I would say like if you're an innovator doing something and you're small and you're not backed by a big label, then it's gonna take time for people to kind of understand it. But reggaeton has been really kind of been like fed mm -hmm. to people. There's been a lot of money put behind it. So I kind of understand why it's become a vernacular, you know, but what we do is sort of us, you know, doing something independently. And we have like kind of like a small scene amongst mm -hmm. the ones that you could say are doing this sort of more Latin experimental pop, but we're all like, you, we all come from like more independent labels and it's small, so it's a small movement. But then it's kind of interesting, though, that I guess 
bigger people in the industry are kind of paying some sort of attention to us. This album is absolutely amazing. It's one, I think it's my, it's my favorite album of 2020. That's, wow. That's really cool. Hey. Wow. Which brings me to this beef I have with you guys, okay? Oh boy, here I we got, go. I got beef with you guys. 11 oh tracks. And my favorite song is the shortest song on the album with Fiebre. Ahí viene la liebre, de manto su tiente. Está el caliente y humilde comenzó. Why was Fiebre a minute and 11 seconds, please? Fiebre, we, wa we originally wanted to try and make it long, but then La Fiebre was kind of this like weird experimental track. And I think we tried making it longer. All right, all right. On the download, we do have a longer version, but it's just not as good. Yeah, we it's have just... a longer version, and then we were planning on playing the extended version live. Yes. Like we were going to play La Fiebre, like make a whole extended version, make it a whole party live. Because honestly, I think that we tried extending it, but the interesting thing is that La Fiebre is actually... <laughs> the, the song is about describing... Bad Bunny. The la fiebre of the people when we came back to the island and how he became like the this king, new like yeah. thing he got. Yeah, there's like icon. la fiebre speaks yeah. about him, and then in a way like we felt like la fiebre is sort of the odd man out of the record, and then we ended up saying like maybe we should just do these like little short little things in the record where we're not fully like developing them to songs, but they still color the record. I mean, we can't wait to play this album live. How have you guys dealt with that aspect? Musicians without an audience, how does that even work? It's a weird one. Well, but there is an audience. I mean, you there know, an... but it's not live. It's not live. It's really not live. Isn't the whole thing about I need to feel the energy to create. And when you don't have that energy, it's just data numbers, algorithms. That's that is sucky. Um, but you know what happened? Something interesting happened and is that we started getting hit up to do remixes and collaborations. And so it was interesting because we were finally able to kind of be excited in the studio and not work on our own music, mm -hmm. but maybe like we've always wanted to collaborate more with people. And it's interesting how during the pandemic, like people started, we started collaborating with people, but just, you know, remotely, like it was still Lisa and I sitting in the studio, but we were literally like working off of, other people's music and then it was really the collaboration of both of us and i feel like in the moment i think that because it was something new like it really kind of satiated it satiated mm -hmm. i think in a way uh, a, a new like it brought in a new experience satisfied. with music and, and yeah and it satisfied a part of it i don't i don't think that i could be happy just living in a studio but at least because of the fact that that came like it took my energy away from like live because I didn't even want to get, I didn't even want to th think about it because it's just so like, I didn't, you know, it's like, let me just entertain myself with these collaborations with these, like with this production work in the meantime and mm -hmm. let us put these producer hats on and writing hats on for now. And let's kind of forget a little bit about our live personas, right. <laughs> but mostly just to kind of like not cope. That's Mostly right. to cope. I mean, I totally miss it. I feel like I'm a completely different person. I feel like I sing better because of the adrenaline when I'm in front of people. I feel like I sing way better when I'm in front of a crowd than when I'm singing in our like studio with a mic and some iPhones on to make some live video for some promo thing. Like I, I suck. I tell Luis, I'm like, I totally suck. Like I really <laughs> need the energy. Yeah of people to really kind of become this other person. Right. But for now, I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to think about it too much. <laughs> so 2021 is here. Do you feel that, uh, that Regresa is lost to time now and that you feel that you need to put out a new album to be able to create a new buzz? Because how do you continue to create a buzz of an album that was done early 2020 and that has some of that identity from that year? Do you feel like you need to put out something new now? 
Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the times we live in where you just have to constantly be putting out new stuff? You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, we're eventually we're going to have to put out a new record anyway. You know what I mean? Like we're going to have to do it. We would like to, you know what I mean? Like it's something, I don't think we're, you know, our whole lives just led up to making one record. I think, you know, ideally we can do a lot more, but I mean, just, you know, at the end of last year, we got hit up by this guy called Jay Cortez. Um, the reggaetonero he's a guy, right? Producer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a songwriter, producer, he's a, does reggaeton, Latin trap stuff, and... and um, yeah. He just put out Dakity. Yeah, um, he just put out Dakity with, like with Bad Bunny. Some it's, big song now. Yeah, it's pretty huge. But, um, but he hit us up and he was like, you know, I would love for you guys to sort of work with me on this new record that I'm doing, this and that and the other. And it sounded like really wild, like, like okay, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever. We'd love to make music. Let's, let's see what happens, you know. And, uh, and so we went over to his house and we met him and everything. And, and it ended up being that, you know, it was like, well, I want you to do an interlude and I want you to record some vocals here and I want you to record the thing at the end of, so, you know, we, we already did it. We, it's already done. We've already handed it in. And so if, if it goes through the filters and, and uh, in, in the reggaeton land and they, and they dig it and it's pressed, then we'll have something new this year out, you know? It's just, yeah, it's just I feel like we're, it feels that the newness is sort of in all these new collaborations. Mm-hmm. Like we put our own album out and now we're just re- kind of like, I guess uh, reinstating our identity through these uh, collaborations with other people. But eventually I feel like probably a good way to do it is like maybe put a few singles out and maybe like we're trying to plan to see if we could maybe tour some very small tour in the fall. Because I, I I get what you say. Like it would suck to put a new album out and then just like ignore Regresa completely. Like we have to have a solid strategy because. Especially when something is that good. I almost feel like you guys need to re-release it again for 2021 to be some able like, to. Like reloaded deluxe, some reloaded deluxe version. Why not? <laughs> I mean, listen, I think I, I think if you go to a record label, right? Your, your, your record label uh, boss and you say, hey, listen, man. May 2020, we couldn't fulfill the vision, the full, complete, comprehensive vision of what we wanted to do with this album artistically and commercially. And because we weren't able to do that, what we want to do is we want to repackage it because it's still new, but we're going to make some tweaks on it, maybe change the album cover for like, you know how comic books have like the primary cover and then they have like this yeah. uh, Valiant Japanese cover. cover. Right. Japanese and it's the way to that. refresh the same comic book for a new generation of people. That's where we'll stick the extended version. of Yeah. Bonus track, like hidden seven minutes after the last one. And then we hear that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. I mean, it's not, it's seriously, it doesn't sound like a bad idea to me. I I, I think it's an amazing idea. We're definitely thinking about it. This is new. I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see how, all of these artists that had like bomb records, like really great records in 2020. Mm-hmm. Like I'm sure that this is going to be like a, a, a thing. never before seen strategy. You know what I mean? I'm sure that that's what we're going to see. What track out of Regresa would you leave us as the last dance for this episode? I think Nidia has, yeah. a, has a really good Nidia. sort of uh, flip, you know, and starts off. Uh, maybe in in a bit of a in a bit of a dark place and That's ends up cool. you know in a bit of a revelation I'd say you know? so maybe that one. yeah it's like a revolution it's kind of doubting yourself and then just really like just letting go of the fear and the pain and then like just allowing yourself to just you know like not be fearful anymore so I feel like we need a lot of that right now. You can listen to Busca Buya and their latest album, Regresa, on all audio platforms. And before I wrap up here, here are three Latin tracks you might want to add to your playlist this weekend. La Luz, Fin, Cali Uchis y Buscabulla. Dime si no me perdonas. 
Lo vas a olvidar, Rosalía y Billie Eilish. No Una vez, Selena Gomez. No te tengo a ti, me tengo a mí. No es para que piense que esto es patina. Yo me fui para que no se te olvide. Que una muerte como tú se revive. Cuando se sé que el último man. That's it for episode 147 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I'd like to thank Richard Blanco and Luis and Raquel de Buscabulla for coming on the show. And if you like the show, Please subscribe and leave a review if you feel value in what we do. Also, we have a new podcast about race and pop culture called Brown and Black with Mike Sargent and me. It's available on all podcast platforms. I'm Jack Rico. See you next week on another episode of Highly Relevant. Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited.